always loved horses. Steeplechase and horse racing were once popular sporting events. But the, the rich used to go to Muskoka, but the others, the rest had it all in that bay, it was just like a Muskoka. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. The railway was elevated on concrete and iron pilings, like a bridge in its construction, at about a 30 degree angle. The most common entry into Hamilton at the turn of the century would have been by rail. Staring out of the coach window, one would have marveled at all the activity on the bay. Sailboats glided under a soft breeze, while some boats were just being built. Gangs of men moved cargo down at the coal and wheat wharves. Another group of immigrants arrived as the train pulls into the Stewart Street station. Names like Mahoney, Murphy, Askew, Gibb, Polaniato, Thompson, Agro, and others would soon take their place within the community mosaic. John Morrison Gibson was one of the certainly dominant figures in uh, 19th, early 20th century uh, Hamilton history. It even started when he was still a, a, a pupil at Central School. He happened to be called on to uh, officially turn on the uh, water in Gore Park, which was uh, quite a feather in his cap. He was an extremely uh, powerful man in terms of Hamilton's transportation, electricity needs and then politically as well, and he even later became uh, the Lieutenant Governor of uh, Ontario. So he was one of the key people in so many aspects of, of Hamilton in the 19th century. We learned to tell the time by the trains when we were little. My mother would go to work and she'd tell us now when 5062 comes in and then you have your lunch. We will watch for 5062. <laughs> but sometimes they'd put another one in, you see. So we'd be watching for 5062, and 5574 would come in with the train. So we were stuck there. We didn't have no luck. <laughs> the bad times in the 30s there, the people would fish that have four or five rods sticking out of the wall with a bell on and the fish line. The bell would ring, well, maybe they'd have a carp and be while well, they had their supper, you know. And the CNR train just come along here and stop. There used to be a lot of guys riding the rails. Of course, as soon as they got off, they were hungry. They'd walk along the shoreline, come knock on the door and wonder if they'd have a sandwich. See? So my wife answered the door. First guy. She said, sure, come on in. The guy looked pretty good. He's just passing through town. <laughs> so we gave him a sandwich and a cup of tea and that. Oh, he thanks us and away he goes. He's not going to have an hour, another guy comes. The guy spread the word around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they Put come work on your all summer. Yeah. I, I believe I started going to the bars, uh, naturally as an underage drinker like everybody else did, but it was easier to get away with it in those days. So I think I would have started in the late 50s and certainly uh, visited a lot of these establishments until I moved to Toronto in, in the mid-60s. There were, at that time, many, many uh, dives around Hamilton, the old uh, beverage room style hotels, but there was four main, well, five main bars downtown that were quite uh, hopping. One was the, uh, the Flamingo, or the Flam as we used to call it. My brother remembers being thrown through the swinging doors there many times, but not me. 
Then there was the Grange, of course it was a Chinese restaurant when Ronnie Hawkins uh, started there, played there all the time. And then there was the uh, Golden Rail. They all had uh, live bands all the time, every night of the week. And, and very good, good uh, R&B guys, the rock and roll people, uh, the whole thing. Uh, then there was Duffy's Tavern. That was another one that was right down there across from Gore Park. I can recall very well seeing Ike and Tina Turner there back in the early 60s, a terrific show, I might add. Crown Point began as a racetrack, the Hamilton Jockey Club designed to be the finest in North America, held its first race on June 1st, 1893. On race day, patrons paid a 50 cent admission to the field, or a $1 admission to the grounds and grandstand. The grandstand, described simply as handsome, faced south toward the mountain and could seat up to 1,500 people. The grounds featured two race tracks, one within the other. In the center was a steeplechase track complete with water jumps. Inside, guests found a sprawling property complete with a clubhouse, betting ring, saddling paddocks, and stables. The first winner at the track was a horse named Victorious, who won by a nose. The old track enjoyed a long life, but finally, in 1952, came to the end of the line. With one bale of tobacco, George Tuckett proclaimed himself a cigar manufacturer when he was barely out of his teens in 1857. When plug tobacco became a scarce commodity south of the border during the American Civil War, George took advantage of an opportunity and made his first fortune. Over 600 employees worked in a clean and safe environment, shipping product worldwide from a factory built at Queen and York Streets in the 1860s. Tuckett's factory was state-of-the-art and made his company the largest producer of cigars and tobacco in the country. By 1892, Tuckett unveiled plans for a stately mansion befitting his status to be built at the corner of King and Queen Streets. The building will be situated on one of the finest sites in Hamilton and will be a grand addition to the city's many fine residences, among which it will stand in the first rank. It would later be taken over by the Scottish Rite Masons in 1920. Bought out by Imperial Tobacco on September 17, 1966, the Hamilton-based company would finally close its doors after nearly 109 years in business. The escarpment created quite a barrier to transportation. There was a set of stairs that gave you access to the Mountain View Hotel. But it wasn't until 1892 that the novelty of an incline railway was built. The hotel was poised to become a major tourist attraction when the city introduced the Hamilton and Barton Incline Railway, the Incline at James Street had two tracks, each carrying a 36-foot long car. As one went up, the other would descend, traversing the 195-foot elevation in less than 90 seconds. Each railway car could hold dozens of pedestrians with room for two horse-drawn wagons. That is, until the automobile made its entrance. 
not only was that a good location for the incline, just for the purpose of moving people up and down the escarpment, but it tied in nicely with the hotel because now the hotel's business really took off because uh, a person from Toronto could take a steamer to Hamilton, get off at the base of James Street, take a streetcar all the way up to the end of the line where it met the incline, take the incline up to the Mountain View Hotel, have an afternoon there and go home. The Canadian Illustrated News once wrote, The bay on the shores of which Port Hamilton was founded is one of the finest and most placid to be found among Canadian lakes. Late in the 18th century, Lady Simcoe tried to capture the essence of the bay's charm in her sketches.